All right. Welcome back to the Barbell Therapy Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Brett Scott. And with me here today is Dr. Kim Buonamo. And she is a uh, Dr. Kim Buonamo slash to be Dr. Norton. Um, <laughs> she's getting married in a few weeks. So uh, she is here today to talk all about pelvic pain, pelvic dysfunction, uh, and all things related to pelvic floor. So I've had the pleasure of working with Kim for uh, quite maybe three or four years now. Yeah. Uh, because I had a power lifter, weightlifter referred uh, that was dealing with some back pain and also some pelvic issues. And uh, we've made a great referral source for one another back and forth and kind of complemented each other in the rehab process. And so to me, the pelvic floor space is something that is not completely unknown to me, uh, but it's not something I treat on a regular basis or really know all that much about how to treat. Sometimes we will see these things and I'll email Kim and be like, hey, I have this. Could this be related? Could this be something to do with pelvic floor? And then I get these emails with all kinds of information and then where I learn plenty. But and then you get my essays back. Yeah, yeah. then I get the essays. Uh, but there's a lot that we see on our end as orthopedic PTs that people present symptoms with where they could have groin pain, they could have low back pain. And sometimes these are the common things we see. And if you're someone out there that has these things and they're not making sense and they're not getting better, they're not responding to PT there's a potential that you could have something else. And when we have these conversations with patients about, is there something else going on? Do you have issues with constipation, diarrhea, uh, completely emptying yourself, peeing yourself, problems with erections for men out there, um, you know, incontinence, there's so many different things. It's like, oh yeah, actually I, I have been dealing with these things. They didn't want to tell us, but these are all things that could be related to pelvic floor. And there's a host of other things too, I'm sure I'm not thinking of. So uh, my guest here, Kim, is on to uh, present some of those things for us. So uh, Kim, thanks for coming on. And um, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background in the pelvic floor space. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so I've been a PT for six years uh, and I've been at the Pelvic Health and Rehabilitation Center in Lexington for the last four. And that's uh, 2018, four years ago is when I decided to specialize in pelvic health. So I've been um, a pelvic health specialist since then. So um, I really, really love the education sphere of pelvic floor physical therapy. And so since 2018, I've been a guest lecturer at UMass Lowell, as and I did prior to COVID at um, Mass College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences as well, give their pelvic health lectures to their PT students. Um, I am a clinical mentor, so I lead weekly discussion groups and answer, you know, when some of the newer staff have questions about their cases, you know, I help kind of walk them through some of the complexities. Um, I've been a teaching assistant at a complex pelvic pain syndromes course. And uh, two months from now, uh, shortly after my wedding, I am going to Kenya with my uh, company as well as the Jackson Clinics Foundation. And we are going to teach Kenyan physical therapists how to specialize in pelvic floor. Um, so I've been keeping myself busy. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds it. So um, for everyone that doesn't know Kim, she knows her stuff and she's someone uh, that I trust all my patients with. And we've sent plenty of patients back and forth. So, um, you know, there's a whole host of things I have to ask myself today and um, things I want to learn from this talk. So uh, the, the first thing I think people need to know is what are like the big common misconceptions that uh, are around pelvic PT? So for me, the big ones are pelvic PT isn't for men. Um, I, it only has to do with post-pregnancy issues or peeing yourself. And, you know, I'll just go there and they're going to have me do Kegels. Yeah. So those are definitely three of the big ones. And unfortunately, you know, they're, these misconceptions are very common, but they are just that. They are misconceptions. And so, you know, talking about pelvic floor PT isn't for men, at our company, so we have two locations on the East Coast. We have one in Merrimack, New Hampshire, and one in Lexington, Mass. And we have eight in California. 
And we really specialize in the treatment of pelvic pain more so than pregnancy, postpartum, or, you know, any other of these subsets of pelvic floor PT. Now, we see a lot of that stuff as well, but, you know, pelvic floor PT being for men, company-wide, we see about a 60-40 split. So we do see a little bit more female patients than male patients at this point, but we see almost half of my caseload is people who are born with a penis. And, you know, absolutely. Also, we see people, you know, transgender individuals, we see people, you know, of all genders. And my big thing that I always say, anyone with a pelvis can have pelvic floor dysfunction, right? Um, Anyone who has a pelvic floor that functions can have pelvic floor dysfunction. So absolutely, it's not just for men. Um, it, you know, thinking about pregnancy and postpartum, you know, very personally speaking, this isn't a company wide statistic, but probably 20, maybe 30% of my patient caseload is pregnant or within the first year postpartum. So again, it's absolutely a thing that can happen to your pelvic floor. It's a thing that can cause pelvic floor dysfunction, but it's not all I see. And then they're just going to have me do Kegels. I think we're going to get into a lot more depth on this later in our chat, but no, you know, um, Kegels are great. Kegels are really important in a very particular subset of folks with pelvic floor dysfunction. And so, you know, when you broaden that definition of, you know, considering all my patients with chronic pain, considering my patients who are post-op, considering my patients who have endometriosis or other, you know, pelvic pain conditions, constipation. If you're having an issue where your pelvic floor muscles aren't relaxing effectively to let something happen, and, you know, in my world, that could be constipation, like not relaxing effectively to poop. Um, or not relaxing effectively to allow for comfortable sexual penetration or a comfortable gynecological exam, Kegels are the last thing you want to do in a patient like that because it's going to take a tight muscle and make it tighter. And the other big misconception regarding Kegels that I often see is in that patient subset who might benefit from Kegels, right? If you're, you know, and it's not exclusively to postpartum women, but, or, or, you know, postpartum people, but in the patients who do benefit from Kegels, there is so much more to my job than saying, great, go do Kegels, right? You know, that's, you know, in the ortho world, like saying you sprained your ankle, great, go strengthen your ankle. Like, <laughs> no, you, you, you know, as a PT, okay, well, are we talking about strength, endurance, coordination, motor control? You know, are we looking at, you know, if you sprained your ankle, how would you run now? You know, it's so much of a bigger picture when we talk about Kegels, you know, are you leaking under a lot of pressure over a short time, like a cough or sneeze? Are you leaking when you've been walking for half an hour and now your pelvic floor endurance is poor and your muscles can't keep up with that demand? Are you leaking when you start adding a complex activity to that? Or are you leaking in the middle of the night? You know, so it really, there is is so much science and so much more specialization to this than you know, if, if I just saw postpartum people who leaked, I'd probably be out of a job. I, I, I would see a much smaller clientele than I'm really seeing. Yeah. I think the other big thing that needs to be known by just about everyone, uh, especially when I think it's 80 million of people or more now have back pain. And this is why I sent my patient to you of I had a patient that had some back pain, had some groin pain and some hip pain. And um, mechanically, I didn't find anything that really was reproducing her back pain symptoms, but she had this pain that was going. And then she told me she had some issues with some endometriosis and uh, they went in and did a procedure to scan and, and look for things and they didn't find anything. And then the next answer she got from the doctor was, well, we're just going to do a surgery. And I was like, hold on, let's, let's not do surgery just because we didn't, because we didn't find anything. Let's just take it out. Uh, Maybe sometimes it is the answer, but I think people should look at, well, let's not just look at structures, but let's look at function too of, is there just something I'm doing not as optimally as I could be 
and prevent something completely unnecessary and, and potentially that has uh, dangerous effects to it as well. Absolutely. And specifically with endometriosis. Now, endometriosis, we believe, affects one in 10 people who were born with vaginas, right? So um, we are learning so much more about it. But at the moment, the only gold standard way to effectively diagnose endometriosis is actually with surgery. Um, so sometimes if you, you know, want that diagnosis or that's, you know, important to your treatment plan or in order to effectively remove the endometriotic lesions, sometimes, yes, yeah, surgery is absolutely necessary. But I definitely, the reason I say we believe it's one in 10, the actual rate might be much higher because we're not giving a laparoscopic surgery to any person who has the symptoms of endometriosis. You know, we, it, it it's something that we're kind of, working through, you know, very often these patients are treated with oral contraceptives to suppress the hormones that cause the pain associated with endo. But, um, we, yeah, we, um, we think the number is, is realistically much higher, but I often see patients who have unnecessary surgeries for so many other reasons. Um, and yeah, this particular patient that we saw together, you know, there was a lot of other stuff going on. And even actually without doing a pelvic floor exam, I was able to help, you know, in a few other ways, in part thinking functionally, but in part looking more closely at the groin, even externally, you know, there was a lot of other um, contributing factors there. What other um, unnecessary surgeries or procedures do you see that people are potentially having done that might not need done? Well, again, you know, endometriosis laparoscopy is not an unnecessary surgery. That's the gold standard for diagnosing endometriosis. So that is a really important um, distinction to make. But, you know, I very often, I don't know how much I would say unnecessary surgeries I see, but I would say that I see surgeries that I kind of wish the person had been to PT prior to surgery rather than seeing me post-op. Um, a lot of times this has to do with pelvic organ, uh, prolapse repair, um, also inguinal, uh, hernia surgery. So someone who has an inguinal hernia, you know, very well may ultimately end up needing surgery, but if you can strengthen and support their pelvic floor, if you can support their transverse abdominis, they may be able to use their muscles effectively enough to reduce the urgency of a need for that surgery. You know, cause very often I feel like patients are like, I'm in so much pain. I just need need this surgery to make me feel better. Um, and I think there's so much conservatively, you know, both on the pelvic specific side and on just the general orthopedic side that we can do. And, you know, it's also fairly common to have complications postoperatively that can result in pelvic pain. As an example, um, post hernia surgery is common to have an injury to the ilioinguinal nerve, which can result in groin pain. Um, so we absolutely, you know, I, I want people to not undergo surgery when there's stuff we maybe could do prior to surgery to help. And if we go through PT and the patient isn't meeting their goals and we know that there's this underlying structural thing, we say, hey, okay, um, you know, maybe it is time for surgery. Maybe, you know, we've done what we can in PT. Maybe you should go and explore that avenue and then come back to us for post-op rehab. Another example of which is surgery for pelvic organ prolapse. So, you know, when someone has either a bladder sling or um, transobturator tape to kind of support an organ that's descending in a way that it shouldn't be. PT has been shown in pelvic floor PT to rehab prolapse up to one grade. And so we can do a lot to support a patient to improve their function and to help their quality of life without having pain or discomfort associated with these conditions. And so I wish that a lot of people knew that this existed as an option because I can't tell you how many times a patient of mine is like, I've seen six other doctors. I've been in pain for five years and you're the first person who's had any idea what I'm talking about. Um, and I really, that's what's important to me is getting help for these people um, and in a conservative way where, hey, listen, if surgery is down the road for you, okay. But 
I want to know that we've explored all other conservative options because PT, we're not doing we're, we're changing your tissues. We're helping your brain communicate to your body better. We're strengthening, we're supporting, but we're not cutting, you know? And in that regard, I don't feel like we're doing anything that we can't come back from, right? Like if you do a surgery and you have scar tissue, you just have that scar tissue now. And there absolutely are interventions to minimize it, but we're not changing the basic structure of those tissues. You know, we're helping them function better. Yeah. Um... One thing we see on on the orthopedic side a lot, and this can very well relate to pelvic floor dysfunction, is herniated discs, right? So it's like people people's first thought is, "Well, I have a bad I have a bad back. I have a herniated disc, and I need surgery to fix this because I'm in pain because it's structural, and that's just not the case." So when you come into PT, it's like, well, how did you end up with a herniated disc? It's not that you just have a bad back. There's been something going on that led up to this. And for us, it's like one of the biggest things is, well, how well do you know how to brace your core? Uh, Can you stabilize it under different contexts or conditions? And uh, most of them can't, or, or they don't do it as well as they need to for whatever activity or demand they're putting on themselves. So um, I teach my power lifters to brace much, much different than I teach a runner, but the same fundamentals come down to, we need the pelvic floor to work. And if it doesn't, and you go have a surgery and you go back, well, more discs can just further herniate. So let's fix the source of it first. And most of the time with herniations, even though they're structural, they can heal, they can resolve. People can go back to a completely hundred percent pain-free life without any surgery and mm-hmm. and get and go back to normal living. So yeah. uh, and and speaking of that too, so patients who so there was a study that showed 95% of patients that had lumbopelvic pain had pelvic floor dysfunction on exam and 83% had one or more pelvic floor conditions. So we really, I think, as an, a whole, need to be screening our orthopedic back pain cases for potential public floor involvement because it's incredibly common. And you're right. If you're not fixing the functional issue, you know, throughout the abdominal canister, so including, you know, I always with every patient, you know, if I just looked at the pelvic floor and didn't think about, you know, the back, the multifidi, the transverse abdominis, the diaphragm, the posture, the movement strategies, I'd be missing a large part of that picture. And so I always am assessing all of those things with, you know, every patient. Yeah. And so for those out there that don't have a full understanding of the pelvic floor, can you just touch upon how the pelvic floor can affect back pain? Sure. So If you think about your abdomen as though it's a canister or a can of soda, at the top of that can is your diaphragm, and at the bottom of that can is your pelvic floor. Wrapping around the walls is your transverse abdominis, and in the back is the multifidi and the back supporting musculature. So, you know, I'll I'll give a different example, and then I'll kind of lead in. If I were to cut a hole in the side of that can of soda... Um, And then I shook up the can. It would leak, right? If I were to pop a hole in the bottom or pop the top open and shake it up, it would leak. So that's an easy way to understand how a certain type of pelvic floor dysfunction, again, it gets much more nuanced than that, but can contribute to pelvic floor dysfunction, right? So now imagine if I had a can of soda and I were trying and it were sealed and intact and everything was working beautifully in that can of soda and I were to crush the sides of the can, I really wouldn't be able to deform that can. It would keep its integrity because it has even pressure on all sides and it has appropriate support throughout. Now, if I were to warp the can in different ways, right? So if you think about, you know, a typical posture as pretty straight, pretty upright, now think about, you know, either your, you know, 80-year-old grandmother who's really hunched forward and now your pelvis is tucked under your butt. Or think about, you know, someone who has a significant arch in their back and they're sticking their booty out a little bit. Now you've taken that 
can of soda and you've twisted it or you've angled it, okay? That A makes the pelvic floor muscles have to work harder to support you because you've changed the way that you maintain pressure throughout the rest of the can. Um, B, as we as PTs know, muscles have an appropriate length tension relationship. So when a muscle is overstretched or overcompressed, it doesn't function as well as when it's at its appropriate resting state. So you've changed some of that length tension relationship. Okay. So you have basically put this can in its worst possible position, but it's holding everything together. Now something happens, you know, and you cough or you sneeze or, you know, that one time I lifted that thing wrong and now you have a back issue. It has a lot to do with how your pelvic floor muscles are supporting your pelvic organs in that abdominal canister, but it also has to do with your core, with your back muscles, with everything along the way. Did that answer your question well? Yeah. I think that's good. It's a bit of a tangent. <laughs> that's okay. We, we like tangents here. Uh, and then I think the other thing is the snowball effect that can have down the line of the other things that start to go wrong from that. So um, like when I see patients and they have these like giant knots and trigger points in their glutes and adductors and things like that, I'm like, ooh, okay, what, why is this here? So what's going on there? Yeah, that's actually something else um, that I realized I, I should have included. So a really important way that a little more directly pelvic floor muscles contribute to back pain is referral patterns of trigger points. And so we can actually palpate and access, you know, hip muscles in the pelvic floor. Piriformis and obturator internus are, you can palpate the proximal uh, attachment internally. Um, and trigger points often in the pelvic floor, you know, in all of the muscles of the pelvic floor, eh, almost all the muscles of the pelvic floor, can refer pain to the back, to the tailbone, to uh, the hip, to the groin, to these other external areas. So when a, a overworked muscle has now become tight and dysfunctional and has these knots and these trigger points, you know, I very often can touch someone's pelvic floor muscle internally and have them go like, oh my gosh, what was that? You just caused my normal back pain. Um, and that's how we know really directly that the pelvic floor muscles are are involved in that way too. Mm. Um, and so <laughs> when you say internally, what are you talking about? Because I think I've sent some patients your way and I think they went to, one went to the Merrimack office because it was a little bit closer, but he came back and he was not happy with me on the type of massage he got. It's not massage, it's <laughs> manual therapy, right? So, you know, as PTs, we're really not massaging patients for the purposes you'd go to like, you know, a massage envy for, right? Um, but we do absolutely use our hands to make changes to muscles in the only real way that we can access the deeper muscles of the pelvic floor is internally. And so we also do provide a handout to all of our patients that says, hey, this is what to expect when you're coming in to a pelvic floor PT session. So we look externally, we look at, you know, core, you know, back, hips, everything externally. But yeah, when I say an internal exam, I'm assessing the muscles that live from your pubic bone to your tailbone that support your bladder, your, if you're born with a prostate, your prostate, if you're born with a uterus, your uterus, and your anus. And so when people have vaginas, it means I'm putting a finger in their vagina. People have rectums, it means I'm putting a finger in the rectum. And first and foremost, we don't do anything you're not comfortable with. And definitely, actually, that patient who we shared, I never did an internal exam because she said, I don't want that. And I said, okay, that is absolutely your right and your bodily autonomy. But in order for me to feel what's happening at that group of muscles, I have to feel them. And, and they live internally. So I have to work internally. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's just something I think a lot of people don't realize that they can get up there and, and do different things in there. And I'm not sure if this is true, but do you guys dry needle internally as well? Or some people can? We can. We can. Yeah. And I do. I don't do it often, frankly. Um, I'm more when I'm dry needling, I'm doing like hips, adductors, you know, external, but pelvic girdle musculature, but absolutely. And I am trained in internal needling. I just, I don't use it very often. Um, I feel like it's, 
I feel more confident with my hands and my finger working internally and knowing where I am than a needle that I don't have sensation through or perception through. Sounds just sounds not not fun either to have a needle anywhere near no, there. And, and that's more, you know, when you start to have that conversation with the patient, you're like, so here's what I want to do. Yeah. Usually the, the question is like, is that necessary? And yeah. The answer is no, no, we'll we'll do something else. Yeah. And so um what what typically brings patients to this point of having pelvic floor dysfunction? So like, you know, for me, I know that pregnancy, like a natural delivery and childbirth will do um, some significant stretching of the muscles and structures of the pelvic floor. But for, you know, men that don't have children and go through that, what are some contributing factors we see in kind of everyone across the board that can lead to pelvic floor dysfunction? Right. So when we're talking about pelvic floor dysfunction in general, it could be, you know, any number of it, really pelvic floor. Yeah, it could be any anything really. More often than not, my patients are of the it's the straw that broke the camel's back um, variety rather than, you know, I fell off my bike and I landed on my tailbone and it was never the same. Or, you know, I had a baby and I had no other risk factors and I didn't heal effectively. Much more often, you know, as I'm kind of diving through my history and with when I'm talking to any patient, I'm always asking about their urinary bowel sexual function. I'm always asking about pain. I'm always asking about, you know, if they were pregnant, their pregnancy history, if they're a man, if they have any issues with their prostate. But um you know, diving through each of those categories. Some usually it's, you know, a history of yeast infections or UTIs, constipation, straining, history of birth control use for prolonged periods of time can absolutely contribute to pelvic pain. Um, surgeries, trauma, um, in men, prostatectomy surgery can absolutely cause pelvic floor dysfunction. Menopause can be very often associated with pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, the list goes on. How does oral birth control cause pelvic floor dysfunction in females? Yeah. So when the, the sorry, let me formulate my answer effectively. When we are on birth control, it affects our hormones. We're flooded with synthetic hormones that mimic the job that our real hormones are supposed to do. And as a result, it increases something called SHBG, which is sex hormone binding globulin, which results in a decrease in free testosterone in our body. So humans, you know, cisgender women need testosterone, men need estrogen. It's not an exclusive to one gender. And so when there's an increase in SHBG, and some people are more prone to it than others, and there's, I believe it's a genetic coding, I could be mistaken there, that predisposes someone to develop what we call vestibulodynia, but pain of the vestibule or the opening of the uh, pelvic floor, kind of where the internal vagina meets the external vulva. Um, when you're not getting the hormones that you need in that area, you can end up with pain, dysfunction, you know, all kinds of stuff. We have a great blog series on my company's blog, which is um, pelvicpainrehab.com, all about the influence that birth control pills can have on uh, pelvic floor function and pelvic pain and pain with sex specifically. I did not know that was a um, risk factor for increasing pelvic floor dysfunction. So that's an interesting one. And it's the research is well accepted. Like it's definitely, it's been around for a while, but it's still kind of making its way to the gynecologist of the world. So seeing a gynecologist who really is well versed in the pelvic pain sphere and is up to date on this research uh, is really important for patients of mine because they want to, you know, the I think for so long the birth control pill was just so widely prescribed because it was easy and accessible. We really want to, there's a risk of stroke. There's a risk of all kinds of health complications. And with any medication, you want the benefits to outweigh the risks. And so you always want to see a provider that's really well informed and who can have those conversations with you in understanding um, 
you know, what the right choice for any individual in their medical health is. Yeah, certainly. And um, it's interesting you you say that because now I'm starting to see and hear, especially where I, I own a gym too, and we have a fair amount of uh, younger to middle-aged women now all coming off of birth control, not because they're trying to get pregnant, because just the side effects and what we're kind of starting to see birth control is doing to people from all kinds of different perspectives. And absolutely, um, I should probably have someone on my podcast at some point to discuss all those uh, risk rewards to that. I have some great names. I can I can send you some. People. Yeah, that'd be great. I, I work with a lot of great professionals in this arena. Yeah, for sure. Um, that would be awesome. And so, what are some ways, or, or is do you have a stat at all of how many people encounter pelvic dysfunction? at some point in their lives. Yeah. Um, so I want to disclaimer all of these stats by saying, I think it's very underreported. Um, Probably. I think for a lot of reasons, I think that people don't like to talk about their pelvises. I think that it's hard to get access to healthcare and access to a healthcare professional who's going to, you know, hear you and help you effectively and be in the know enough again about the pelvic pain sphere that they can really treat you comprehensively and and do something about it. I can't tell you how many patients who have told me that their gynecologist told them to just relax and have a glass of wine. And that's not a comprehensive medical treatment. Um, But, you know, the, the commonly current accepted numbers are about 20 to 25% of um, people who are assigned female at birth or, you know, women have pelvic pain and two to 16% of men. But we actually suspect that that number is a lot higher because of, you know, this whole thing called chronic pelvic pain syndrome, which very often gets misdiagnosed as prostatitis. Um, So I can talk about that a little more if that's okay. Yeah, that'd be interesting. I want to hear more about that. Yeah. So prostatitis, um, you know, itis is your inflammation of the, you know, so inflammation or irritation of the prostate is the most common reason that men go to a urologist. And there's true prostatitis, bacterial prostatitis, is when there's an infection in the prostate that is bacterial and is causing these irritated symptoms of the prostate. But it's esti- there is a subset that's called non-bacterial prostatitis, which we call chronic pelvic pain syndrome. And it's estimated that 90% of prostatitis cases that go to a urologist are actually this chronic pelvic pain syndrome, which does not have a bacterial component. So these people go to their doctor. They say, I'm having prostate pain or pain with urination or, you know, urgency, hesitancy, you know, all kinds of symptoms. Their urologist, you know, doesn't necessarily do a bacterial culture and they just say, oh, prostatitis, go take antibiotics. They take the antibiotics, they don't really help. They go back and they say the infection's back and they say, oh, it must have come back. And they go on these multiple, multiple rounds of antibiotics that were for an infection that isn't actually bacterial. It isn't actually there. So the the statistic is it takes about seven years for a man with chronic pelvic pain syndrome to get a proper diagnosis and then treatment starts. So, you know, if you call, about, call that 16% of men, you know, it's not considering these, all these people who are getting diagnosed with chronic bacterial prostatitis when they actually have non-bacterial prostatitis and, and associated pelvic floor dysfunction. Now, where should a man... So if a man has pelvic pain down there and, and they suspect something like that, where do they start their, their treatment journey? Where do they go first? Urologists can be wonderful. Um, but again, seeing a urologist who really knows about pelvic pain, because many of them don't, um, absolutely, I think a multidisciplinary approach is the right answer. So absolutely, go see your urologist. Get ruled out for anything medical. Get ruled out for bacteria. But also see a pelvic floor PT. You know, I think that that is a really important um, associated provider. And, you know, I'm biased. I am one. But, you know, you uh, just like you, you know, you want to see the right specialist for the right body system, right? You know, I can't rule in or out a bacterial infection. You, You absolutely need a urologist to do that. Urologists 
may not be as effective as a PT, or I'd say aren't as effective as a trained pelvic floor physical therapist at ruling in or out pelvic floor muscle dysfunction. And you can have both happen at the same time. And how does a non, how does non-bacterial prostatitis occur? Like what are some um, common occurrences that happen that, you know, precede the, you know, onset of that? So when I see a patient who is presenting with that, they're usually telling me, you know, it's that same straw that broke the camel's back. They usually have a long-standing history of constipation. Maybe they're a power lifter. Maybe they, you know, sit on the bike seat, maybe a triathlete who's doing a lot of cycling. Um, and basically through, you know, they maybe they're stressed and they're clenching and guarding their pelvic floor muscles. Um, but through kind of, you know, a, a long series of associated pelvic floor triggers, they end up with a pelvic floor that is too tight and isn't relaxing effectively, okay? When your pelvic floor muscles, especially what we call the urogenital triangle, so the muscles that support the base of the penis in men, the same muscle group in women surrounds the opening of the vagina, these muscles, if they're really tight and they can't relax, they can irritate the urethra by just mechanical compression. You know, they're, they're causing an inflammation, irritation locally. They can also have trigger points or knots in the muscles that are referring pain to the bladder or referring pain to the urethra. They may not be able to relax those muscles effectively to get the pee out. And now they're saying they have hesitancy when they pee is that like I stand at the toilet and nothing happens, you know? So all of these symptoms can mimic a true UTI. Very interesting. Um, and so uh, we touched on two of people think just ha or have this assumption that doing Kegels can make them better when it actually sounds like, and what I've heard before too, is sometimes Kegels can make certain people's people worse and you need to be really careful about choosing that as the exercise prescription for yourself or if you're working with someone and you don't know much of as much about the pelvic floor. Um, so are there ways to like classify and group people? So like what, what, from what I know from talking to you a lot is we have people that can be hypertonic. So very much an increased tension on the muscles. They're not going to be muscles that can relax. Uh, they don't want to be stretched or we can be the other way of, we can be hype. Oh, or low. So low tone where they want to, they, they can't contract They're very relaxed. They're almost too relaxed to function properly. So are there, and this is more of one of the questions that I wanted to know more about is how do we classify those things and what do we see presented to us? Yeah. So when I'm, if I'm narrowing into just the pelvic floor, you know, and again, my job, I, I'm looking so much externally as well and functionally as well. When I'm talking about the hammock of actual pelvic floor musculature, it can, I, I narrow down to one of three things and it, they can all, you can have more than one at the same time. So it's either low tone which is a weak pelvic floor. That is your, what everyone assumes is the postpartum need to do Kegels thing. You know, there's no one diagnose. Knowing a diagnosis is actually, there's no way if you just say someone is leaking urine when they cough or sneeze, they must have a blank, high tone, low tone pelvic floor. You can have whatever symptom or diagnosis with either a high tone or low tone condition. Um, but sorry, that was an aside. So low tone pelvic floor needs to be strengthened. That is a muscle that's too weak to function. High tone pelvic floor is a muscle that's too tight or too guarded. Okay. So you can kind of have one or the other, or you can even have, and I see very often patients with high tone, like uh, hip stabilizers, like patients with a trigger point in their obturator, patients with a trigger point in their piriformis or in their glutes. But who aren't utilizing the superficial muscles that hold in their urine effectively, right? So you can have pain with running because your hip stabilizer has a trigger point, but also leakage of urine because your urogenital triangle is not working right, right? So you can have kind of high tone, low tone, or both. And then you have what I call motor control dysfunction. You can, you can engage, you can relax, but you're not doing the right thing at the right time. So 
more often I'll see someone who's primary high tone or primary low tone who also has a motor control deficit. And we have to really, you know, I, I like shoulders as an analogy. And I know this is a podcast, so it's audio. Not not as much, many people are going to be watching the recording. But when we think about high tone, I think about that person who has their shoulders hiked to their ears all the time, right? And so if I'm that person, I have my shoulders hiked up in my ears all the time. And someone says, shrug your shoulders, And I try and it goes nowhere, right? It looks like it's weak. It looks like I can't execute the movement you asked me to do. And so if you go and put your hand on that person's shoulder and you're like, wow, your upper traps are lit. Like you need to bring your shoulders down and relax. That is a really common presentation I see in the pelvic floor where the muscles are so high tone and guarded and tight that it almost looks like a weak pelvic floor if you don't actually ask them to try and relax or to downtrain or to kind of assess the other side of that scale. Interesting. So just so I can double clarify here too, someone, so like the presentation we see, so like as we talk with patients a lot, it's like the mobility, stability, continuum, and kind of phenomenon of this interchange. So for people out there that have been patients of ours um, in our clinic, um, we talk a lot about proximal stability gives you distal mobility, right? So if our core that's supposed to be stable is, then we can be mobile at our hip. However, so basically what we're saying is the the pelvic floor is still part of the core. And if we don't have the right tone there, so if we're, um, if we're high tone, a dysfunctioning and with high tone in the pelvic floor, we'll see a lot of trigger points and stiffness through the hip, the the internal, external, and rotators of the hip, and and all those pieces. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say how how much more proximal can you get than the yeah. pelvis, right? That that's where all of our load is transferred from. That's where all of our stability comes from. That's such a major orthopedic mm-hmm. site. Now, yeah. will you see? Could someone with low tone through the pelvic floor also still have these trigger points and everything in like the hips and adductors and such? Yes, generally less common. Um, However, you know, somewhat often we'll see patients who's basically, you know, the the colloquial way I'll say it is your pelvic floor is not holding up its end of Mm -hmm. the bargain. Right. So if your pelvic floor muscles aren't supporting you and they're too weak, now you're over engaging your hip stabilizers, you're over squeezing your adductors. Um, and you're, you know, if your core is not working effectively, you might be kind of all clenched through the mid back and the low back, or if you're br- not breathing effectively. So you're going to see trigger points in associated muscles of the dysfunction. And so, you know, this is why it's, I'm a manual therapist. You know, I really, I like working with my hands and it's really important to what I do, but you know, I call it zoom in, zoom out. I zoom in, I look at the pelvic floor, I see what the dysfunction is there, but then I zoom out and look at your posture, how you move, how you walk. Cause what's going on in the neighborhood, like what's going on in all of these other, you know, more distal muscle groups, because it's going to be, A is going to affect B and B is going to affect A. For sure. And, um, I think the hardest part of this for anyone. So there's, there's really, cause as you said earlier, there's no way for someone to truly like self-diagnose or, or get an idea of what they're doing. Cause you, you really need to kind of put your hands in there and figure out if it's high or low tone, correct? Among other yeah. things. Yeah. With the depth, in-depth yeah. history taking and everything else. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. And, um, is there a point where people should start re- uh, searching out treatment or when certain things happen? Cause I definitely, like, as you said, I think things are much underreported and there's been a multitude of cases I've had where it's like, okay, things aren't adding up. Let's ask some questions. And, and especially men, more women, will, more I have, you know, especially all the women you've sent me. Um, we talk about, you know, urine, peeing, pooping, issues they have, pain, and what they have it with, no problem. Where men are like, why are you asking me this question? They're very defensive about it sometimes. It's like, it's okay. Yeah. Like, I'm a medical provider. This is a safe space. But but this affects your care. So you need to tell me what's going on down there. So, uh, And like, 
Thank you. Thank you for having these conversations. Thank you for normalizing these conversations because so often men, anyone, anyone of any gender, I can't tell you even women, how many people I've seen. I was like, I'm so embarrassed. Like, I don't want to talk to you about this. And, you know, I think if you come to my office, you know that that's what you're in for. You know, pelvic is in the name. You know, we're going to talk about your pelvic function. But I think I really want to see us as a society come a long way in normalizing talking about pee and poop and sex and our our pelvises, you know? It's it's important to everything we do and it can be a symptom of something bigger. So, you know, when should someone kind of start? I think we even having a conversation surrounding what normal function is, I think is a really important place to start because so many people too come in and I'm like, do you have any, that one of our, our, our intake form, right? It's, do you have any concerns about your urinary function? Do you have any concerns about your bowel function? Do you have any concerns about your sexual function? I still, with every patient will say, okay, I know you said you have no concerns about your bowel function. I'm just going to run through what's normal. And you tell me if, if this matches ev- you, great. Awesome. See you later. We won't talk about your bowel function anymore. But more often than not, I start diving into the more of the specifics and like, oh, that's not normal. I'm like, no, you know, this is a, this is an associated symptom of pelvic floor dysfunction. If you send me that, you'll probably get more patients. <laughs> <laughs> what they'll they'll question yeah, your list? Yeah, normalcy list. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> gosh. I mean, I I'm happy to talk about it right yeah, now. Yeah, go ahead. Um, we sh- we should because so- I think a lot of people. Um, and I, myself, I didn't realize it. So I had for two years, I was dealing with a parasitic infection and I have all kinds of digestive issues. And, um, as we've talked about on another podcast that I did with, uh, Will Mills, uh, a few months back, uh, you get the squat farts and Mm -hmm. I knew something was wrong, but it was more food and digestive related than it was like pelvic floor. Cause if I ate like a very bland diet, it would all go away. Um, SIBO also. SIBO is a fairly common small intestinal bacterial so overgrowth. I, ha- I have, you know, anything that affects our gut microbiome is going to affect our. Yeah, I floor. had a mild form of SIBO as well, so um, oh. that wasn't fun. But once I got over that, I like because it, it, it happened so slowly and gradually that symptoms came on that I kind of forgot what normal was. And and once I got treated the right way for all these things, I was like, oh yeah, that's that's how it was supposed to be. So go ahead and go through some of these things of what normal is. Yeah. And that that's a super common thing I hear a lot too of like once patients see me and they start to feel better, they're like, I forgot like pooping was supposed to be easy. And I'm like, yeah, because they've been dealing with this dysfunction for mm-hmm. so long. So, you know, the way that I usually kind of phrase it to a patient, I'm like urinary function. All right. So tell me if this is you. Tell me if this isn't. You're going to the bathroom every two to four hours when you're awake generally. You get an urge that comes on fairly appropriately, like, hey, I'm going to have to pee soon. All right, it's time for me to pee. Um, You can hold your pee until that point in time that you can get to a bathroom. When you're in the bathroom, you sit down, you pull your pants down, you pee, it starts right away, comes out all at once. There's no pain. There's no leakage. You feel like you're totally empty. Your urine stream quality is normal and you're not power peeing or drip, drip, dripping. You wipe, you get up, you leave. That's what should happen. And usually it's every two to four hours when you're awake. Obviously, it depends on how much water you're drinking. It depends on, you know, how much you're sweating, you're exercising, a lot of other factors. Um, And under the age of 65, if you're waking up zero or once per night, that's normal. If you're over 65, we lose some bladder elasticity. So you might be waking up twice a night. And your bladder generally shouldn't wake you to pee. You, if you're waking up, besides maybe once a night, if you're waking up four times a night to pee, but you're waking up because the cat jumped on the bed, you're waking up because your partner snored, you're waking up, you know, for some other reason besides your bladder, you know, it's less indicative of a pelvic floor issue. So that's kind of normal urinary function. Normal bowel function follows a similar what happens when you're in the bathroom. You know, you go to the bathroom when you get an urge, the urge comes on fairly appropriately, I'll say, you know, oh, I'm going to have to poop soon. Okay, time to poop. You can make it to the bathroom in time. You're not having trouble holding in your gas or holding in your bowel movements. Bowel movements are soft and formed, generally happening once a day, but normal values, it could be once every three days. It could be three times a day. And that's just different 
per human. You're not pushing or straining. You sit, it comes out, you get up, you leave, you're good until the next time you have to go to you the wipe bathroom. too, right? <laughs> yes, you wipe. You, you sit, you void, you wipe, you get up. <laughs> you shouldn't excessively wipe. You shouldn't feel like, you know, you have to wipe and wipe and wipe forever. Um, in order to be clean, you should feel relatively clean, no bleeding, no hemorrhoids, no fissures. Um, and then normal sexual function, you know, I leave it a lot more general. I just say you can have sex in whatever way you want to without pain and, and do so effectively, you know, and cause that sex looks so different per human. Um, and, and kind of, we go from there. Um, anything else there for normalcy? That's the, the, that's the majority of it. If I'm forgetting something, I might be forgetting something, but that's the majority of it. And you shouldn't have groin pain or, you, you know, you should, pain is a really mm -hmm. big one too. Now, I want to go back for a second to what you just mentioned. So in the powerlifting world that I live in, um, I've seen plenty of people get hemorrhoids and um, I've heard a couple of people getting fissures and, and no. there's this term of people as they call it, blowing an O-ring uh, on squats. So, I've yeah. heard that term. And um, I think the hemorrhoids thing and the, the fissures thing is something that people just kind of accept as like, oh, I just have this thing. Like I genetically am getting hemorrhoids for, you know, some random reason. I'm just bad luck. Like I got the short end of the stick. But there, right. there could be reason to it too, correct? I, oh, God. Okay. Yes. Yes. It, I think it's, it's, uh, I'd say the, the opposite of like, oh yeah, sometimes it just happens, but there could be a reason. I'd be like, there's a reason, like there, there's almost always a reason. And, you know, people might have like an underlying, and this is again, multidisciplinary treatment. If you have a SIBO or a parasite, that's going to affect your stool consistency. And that's going to affect how you wipe, how you strain, how you push, and that can cause a fissure, right? But absolutely, like there's either, if when you talk about squats and lifting, if you're lifting with bad form, if you're holding your breath and you're really valsalvaing, you're asking your pelvic floor to support you more than it's capable of doing. And that's when you you know, blow an O-ring, that's when you lose support in your pelvic floor is because your muscles tried as hard as they could to hold everything together. And you just asked way too much of them and you lost, you compromised that pressure in your abdomen. Now. And that's what a hemorrhoid is. A hemorrhoid is a prolapsed blood vessel. So it, you're straining so hard that you're causing a blood vessel to kind of descend into the rectal cavity where it's not meant to be. It's meant to be in the walls of the rectum. Yeah. And so are, are you saying that just by power lifting and, and doing some of these strength type sports, we're likely to get them or. Um... It's a risk factor, but if you are lifting safely and with good form, you can absolutely lift you know, very effectively, very safely at very high weights and not have any of these issues. But, you know, I think, you know, and in your world, you know, this form is so critical. And I see patients who are power lifters fairly often, but I see them, you know, when they're not supporting their bodies, you know, when they're not training, when they're not up training appropriately, or if they're, you know, progressing their weights very quickly and, you know, holding their breath and straining and, you know, not doing it yeah. effectively. So you're not saying that just because some, because Valsalva is a technique we use in powerlifting. So um, mm -hmm. are you saying that doing a Valsalva will cause it or just if we're not supported in the right way that it could potentially cause it? If you're not supported okay. in the right way, it could absolutely potentially cause it. Okay. And so this brings up another thing that kind of blends us back into the orthopedic world where, um, my my colleague Will Mills there had brought this up and it was an interesting concept to hear from a pelvic therapist. And I want to go through it with you um, because you mentioned bad form and something that I don't know how much pain science you guys do in your worlds of dealing with things, but on our side of communicating with patients and things like we don't want to say it's bad because we we don't really have anything that says one is better than the other, or that if you do this, you're going to get hurt because 
a lot of the research is coming out now saying, well, people aren't herniating discs if their volume and load is good. Um, and we can flex our spine up to 80% and be fine. Uh, but, <laughs> but we still don't have any evidence that says it's good for you. Right. And there's this whole thing out here now of form doesn't matter. Technique and biomechanics don't matter. And a lot of strength coaches and even PTs are getting on this, this train of just keep loading it. You load it. If it's, even if it's painful, we can keep loading it. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And I'm fair, fairly much a stickler for technique and form because there's a huge technical aspect to a lot of these things that we want to do good. And for us, we, I, I know from what I do know and think that, well, if we could do it better, let's just do it better. Let's not just do whatever we feel comfortable mm -hmm. with. Um, even though we say it might not be bad, we don't know if it's good yet. So um, when we're talking about that, I just, I just want to hear your perspective on that as far as like, technique and and form and, and certain ways to do things with training yeah so Sorry, that um, was a rant <laughs> i'll no that's great i mean i'll be honest that this isn't as much of my area of specialization and this is why we share patients because i'm like great now your pelvic floor dysfunction is largely resolved you should go see brett to get back into powerlifting because you know i know this is the area of you've you know chosen to specialize in my, we do a lot of pain science, but I haven't heard as much about, you know, that. And I guess I'll clarify when I, I guess when I said bad form, I was thinking suboptimal for the individual form, you know, and that doesn't inherently mean that if they are hinging at the hips or aren't hinging at the hips or are using your, you know, more of your torso versus whatever, you know, I, I think every human might have a different variation of where they're going to have their optimal body mechanics. So I'm not trying to make everyone fit this mold of like perfect technique or perfect form, but I am trying in my thought process. And again, if there is new science out there, I'm, I'm sorry if, if I'm, I'm not as aware of it, but, um, optimizing how one goes about the tasks that they're trying to go about in order to make their function most yeah, effective. So and that may look different yeah. for each person. But I, I don't hate that you said bad form because as Will said, um, you know, there's all these coaches saying, oh, and, and I do believe everyone has different it, different things that are wrong with them and we need to kind of support and facilitate those things. However, there's this crowd that like, you can't say bad. You can't say this. Like everything has to be positive and anyone can do right. whatever they want and we're just going to load them to get better. Where it's like, Talking to, to Will and you, it's like, if you do it wrong, you could pee yourself. You could poop. You could do any yeah. of these things. So there is, yeah. this comes back to like getting out of pain science and into, well, biomechanics and bracing and all these things still do matter. <laughs> yeah. No. And, you know, it's it's a really immediate, like something like peeing yourself or pooping yourself or blowing an O-ring. Like it's a really immediate form of feedback that, hey, you're you did this and something bad happened. You know, it's like I imagine a similar equivalent in, in your world. It's like, well, yeah, you're you can like roll your ankle as you run. And let's just keep loading that ankle. Like, you know, yes, you do want to keep loading it, but like that's not running and rolling on your ankle is an optimal form of running, right? You're you're gonna injure yourself that way. So, you know, I, I I'd have to, you know, again, certainly dig into the literature. Um, you know, I I, I understand I'm I'm not informed on that, but no, I I definitely everything I've been aware of so far, you know, if if you're leaking when you're doing something you're putting your pelvic floor under more pressure than it's yeah. comfortable handling. Yeah, um, and there, there is something um, that, you know, and I've very recently heard about this and something I'm, I'm continuing to look into myself, but it's a thought process of, so diastasis recti. It's a separation of your abdominal muscles. So you think of your six pack and you have like two halves of your six pack. There's a connective tissue that holds those two halves together. 
So what we used to believe was that if you have a separation of that muscle, you can't do a sit-up ever again for the rest of your life. Like, nope, you can't load that muscle. You can't load that tissue. That's bad for it. That's going to hurt you. What we're learning so much more of is you absolutely can and should load that tissue if there's no pain, if there's no leakage, if you can support with the rest of the supporting musculature effectively we don't want to promote fear avoidance. We don't want to promote someone not doing something. And this ties back into the pain science. We don't want to tell people they can't or shouldn't or will hurt themselves if they do X activity. But I also think that we shouldn't be te- teaching people, you know, to to run on the sides of our ankles rather than on the soles of our feet. You know, like, yeah. I don't well, know. And, and it just, it all goes back to, it's like, there's all this stuff that's accepting the, there's this whole side of pain science, just like keep loading it. Biomechanics don't really matter that much unless you're loading at complete end range. But then it's like, well, if we're doing this and putting the pelvic floor and the abdomen in a position that just doesn't um, flow with, you know, the way the body wants to work in a position that's optimal for it, and and some of what I've studied with uh, the DNS system and dynamic or what we call dynamic neuromuscular stabilization, there's a way the body will perform better when it's in certain positions. And when it feels stable, it can be mobile. And, um, but if we just start going into like all these, like, you know, big extended type positions, as as a lot of athletes already do, and we keep perpetuating that, we could be creating a pelvic floor dysfunction, which could lead to a whole host of other issues. And I just think in the the world of um, biomechanics, versus pain science, pain science hasn't caught on to that with biomechanics yet of, oops, we forgot about this. So it's, it's just an interesting paradox we're kind of in right now of, um, cause pelvic floor is still fairly new to the world too. Um, of people that don't, don't yeah. even know you guys exist. I talk about you guys all the time. I'm like, what they do, what they put needles up there. And I'm like, yeah, they, yeah. they, they can. Um, <laughs> so it's just, yeah. I, I mean, I can't tell you how many patients I'm like, I've been in pain for for 30 years and no one mentioned this. I'm like, cause 30 years ago we were just figuring yeah. it out. So you know? it's just, um, it's very interesting. And so, uh, anything else you have to add on like the powerlifting mechanics, stuff like that, or weightlifting and, um, yeah, I don't know. Um, <laughs> My facetious answer is that's what I send them to you for. Um, But no, seriously, I mean, the pelvic floor is, you know, the, the crux of our stability. It's, it's where all of our load is transferred from, you know, so taking care of your pelvic floor, especially if there's an underlying dysfunction will help you get more out of your powerlifting. You can generate with, you know, and this is more a a study I'm going to quote that was about posture, but with better posture, you can get in more effective pelvic floor contraction. You have reduced leakage, you have better strength, you have better ability to lift. And so, you know, looking at the whole pelvic girdle and the pelvic floor as part of that is going to help you in all areas of your life, especially something that's as physically demanding as powerlifting. Yeah, for sure. So, um, that's good to know. Um, and so for people thinking about this and maybe hearing this episode now, um, are there certain credentials people should look for in a um, pelvic floor PT? Yeah. So there are two um, kind of specialty credentials out there. And uh, one of them is uh PRPC, pelvic rehab, uh, PH, uh, PC, pelvic rehab certified practitioner. We'll double check it and then we'll put it in the show notes. Yeah. I'll double check it and I'll add it. (laughs) Yeah. We'll put it in post. But, um, the other one is a WCS. It's a women's, um, health certified specialist, which I believe they're changing because the APTA, the American Physical Therapy Association, the chapter used to be the, um, women's health division. And I'm actually really happy that they've changed it to the Academy of Pelvic Health. Um, So those are two kind of credentials that one might have. But, you know, really working on a PT who specializes in pain. So I'm not sure if you guys have talked about this um, in other episodes or in, in your world, but as much as credentials 
are great. You know, they, there's no, in, there's, I, but the, the a main incentive to go get a certification or specialization is your own professional development and education. We don't get paid more money for having those credentials or, you know, have any other professional recognition besides by people who know what those credentials are. So I'll say those, one thing I hope that pelvic health providers will move towards is more standardization of training because you can be call yourself a pelvic floor PT. If you take pelvic floor 101, you can call yourself a pelvic floor PT. If you know, like my bosses have been leading experts in the field for 20 years. And unless you go get one of these specific certifications, which doesn't necessarily indicate your ability to treat pain versus, you know, incontinence versus whatever. It's, it's more of kind of a well-rounded specialization. Um, you know, th- there, it's hard to find a really good provider who's well-versed in your, uh, condition. So, you know, reading reviews, calling people and saying, Hey, do you treat men? Do you, do you see, you know, this kind of world is actually, you know, as, as kind of annoying as that is, I think that that's a really good way to kind of vet your pelvic floor PT. Um, more in addition to those certifications that exist. And so what about the practice you uh, work at? Is there a difference between going to pelvic pain and rehab versus uh, like traditional um, PT clinic or like in-network clinic, even if they do do um, pelvic rehab? Yeah. So we at the Pelvic Health and Rehabilitation Center, um, really we specialize in chronic pelvic pain. That's what we do. Um, And so insurance is really tough for any pelvic health provider um, because of the way that reimbursement is structured. You know, things that tend to help our patients specifically in the pelvic floor world get better is one-on-one hands-on care. You know, it's harder for me to assess someone's pelvic floor and have them on the other side of a gym. So we really can't treat two people at the same time, or I wouldn't want to be treated by a pelvic floor PT at the same time as they're treating someone else. I really want them in the room with me, giving me their full attention. Um, and because of in large part, the way that we structure, um, you know, where we don't take insurance, we are cash based. It gives us the freedom, A, to not worry about what insurance companies are going to dictate that we can do with our treatments, right? We don't have to say, well, I get 12 sessions with you and then your insurance is going to kick you out. So if you're not better in that time, good luck, you know? Um, And in part, it gives us the freedom over like the duration of visits to say, what do I really think is going to help this patient most effectively? Um, So sometimes that means I only want to see you for half an hour. Sometimes that means I'm seeing you for an hour because I have a lot that I want to teach you and do with you. In addition, just my company, and that's insurance versus non-insurance of pelvic floor PT. My company in particular, um, you know, me- many people in my company, Stephanie Prendergast, one of the co-owners and co-founders, was, you know, the president of the International Pelvic Pain Society. You know, both of my bosses, Liz uh, Akinjalar and also Steph Prendergast, um, have lectured internationally. They are leading experts in the pelvic pain field, and they really work with all of us as employees to develop our skills in this area. We have continuing education all the time. We're writing weekly blog articles. I definitely encourage if anyone is interested in learning more about pelvic health, our blog is a really great resource and it's um, pelvicpainrehab.com slash blog. We write articles about all of it. You know, so we always are having various guest lectures. You know, you heard at the beginning, I give uh, lots of extras. So we, we keep really up to date on the current evidence and ha- we're really tapped into the network, especially of pain providers. Very nice. Um, and as, as you guys all heard, so if you, if you're listening to my podcast, you're probably interested in barbells and weightlifting and everything else. And after hearing this, um, Kim's the go-to girl and, um, you know, me and her have, uh, been able to co-treat a lot of cases in, um, we're coming at it looking from different scopes, but it's been very fun to kind of go back and forth and, and co-treat in some sense of we're working towards the same goal for these people. We're just focusing on different different parts of them. Absolutely. Which is really cool. So um, if anyone doesn't like me and doesn't want to start with me, go see Kim. <laughs> and so Kim, if anyone has questions <laughs> or anything for you, where can they find you? 
Uh, so me specifically, I'm at the Pelvic Health and Rehab Center in Lexington. Um, you know, our social media handle is at Pelvic Health. So that's on like Instagram and, you know, all of the, the resources. We do a ton of stuff on YouTube. Um, you know, it's at Pelvic Health. We have TikTok at Pelvic Health. So, you know, uh, all, right, all cool. of those areas. Well, thanks for coming on. And anything else you'd like to add before we uh, end the show here? Um, thank you for having me. And this has been great. And I really appreciate co-treating with you and also the opportunity to come on the podcast. And, you know, if you have pelvic floor dysfunction, you're not alone. Or if you think you have pelvic floor dysfunction, go get it checked. You know, if, if there's nothing going on, we'll tell you, great, you have a happy, healthy pelvis. And if there is, we'll fix it so we can get you back yeah, to doing and, the things you love. To, just to add to that a little bit, I, I'd like to say... Um... More, more and more PTs are becoming more and more aware of how much pelvic PT can help individuals and having these pre-screening conversations of what is your pee like? What is your poop like? How are your erections? All these are just normal conversations with us. So don't feel like you can't have them or you're going to be embarrassed by them because we are medical providers. And as, as much as I yes. like to joke around and have fun in the clinic, um, I can put my serious face on and have these conversations about how are we going to help you get out of this and get better? So. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't, you know, don't, don't let embarrassment about talking about some of these things limit you from getting treatment because it, it can get better, you know, and absolutely, you know, there's a lot we can do, but we can't do anything if you don't ask or if you don't. Yeah. show up at our office. So um, anyways, thanks everyone for listening. In the next couple of weeks, we've got a few more guests coming on. So um, I have Steph Allen coming on for ACL tears and um, return to sport in the next few weeks. I have Dr. Rand McLean coming on, um, who's been on Mind Pump Radio um, about hormone optimization for men and uh, for males and females. And I also have Dr. Scott Sigmund coming on about um, laser treatment and some shoulder and knee surgeries. Um, he's a surgeon at Lowell General. So um, thanks for listening, everyone, and uh, hope to have you back next time.